today's Valentine's Day that we're recording this. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's. I don't celebrate right. any colonial holidays, Eddie, but my birthday. I and know, but, I, but uh, this is one at least that's been stripped of its uh, origins. And uh -huh. people could have, like Halloween, people could have a little bit of a fun, a little bit of fun on this. And there was a meet today that was televised that had been postponed, I think, between Penn State and Michigan, number two and three. Although after the meet, Penn State won, so Penn State was three. They'll probably be move up to two and Michigan down to three. And the match of the day was at 174 pounds. A freshman, Carter Starochi, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, of Penn State, against number two, Logan Massa of Michigan, number two in the country. And that's up on YouTube, and I, I linked to that. And that was just a great match. It went into overtime. I how think it's pronounced. The, how long are the uh, rounds? How long do they go in? in they uh, go, regulation is seven minutes, three, two, and two. And if they're tied at the end of seven minutes, the first thing they do is a one minute sudden victory. Mm -hmm. And then they have other 30 second. Uh, periods where you ride out and they count the riding time on that. But this was settled in sudden victory. And it was just a great match. Starachi was obviously the big underdog and was really defending because Massa is really good at uh, getting these single and double leg takedowns. And he got in on him numerous times and he got out of them all, all these different times. It was just really something to watch till finally in the sudden victory, he got a takedown to win. So I recommend, you know, I've given, given away the results, but watch that match. That was, I think, a really good example of college wrestling under American folk style rules. It was an upset and was really decisive because Massa was clearly favored to win. And had he won that match, Michigan would have won the dual meet, even if he only won with the regular decision. And Michigan would have retained its number two ranking in the country. Now, since Penn State defeated them, they're sure in the next rankings to reverse positions on that. But it was just a good match to watch. And it was just good to see another young wrestler developing that hadn't gotten a lot of national attention and uh, people can watch. And uh, the, the problem though, is that like so many sports, college wrestling has really been hit hard by the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of mismanagement. Penn State, which is such a great team over the last decade or so, has, we're coming to the end of the regular season. They still have not wrestled at home because their home meets had to all be postponed because of COVID-19. And number one, Iowa had its big match with, uh, I think it was with, uh, was supposed to be on Friday night. I think it was with Penn State, which people was, that's like, you know, the Yankees and Red Sox or something, you know, Iowa versus Penn State, that had to be postponed. Uh, coach Tom Brands, who's been an Olympic champion and been a very successful coach there, is on the shelf with COVID-19. And two of their uh, starters, who were both returning All-Americans, were on the shelf because of COVID-19. And in a couple of weeks, they're supposed to hold the Big Ten championships at Penn State, where they haven't had a had a meet yet. Yeah, that, I mean, that was the original schedule at the beginning of March, I think in about three weeks. U USA Wrestling had scheduled the Olympic trials for the upcoming Tokyo Olympics, assuming it happens, which I really doubt. That was going to be at the beginning of April at Penn State. They had to move that to Fort Worth, Texas, because they said they couldn't do it safely for various reasons, including COVID-19. So I, I just wrote an article about this on my Patreon site. There's just been a lot of chaos going on in college wrestling. And is it really worth it? I obviously love wrestling and you hear me talking about it. You know, I'm following this and I've watched a few 
meets on TV or you could see them online. But at, at what cost? At what cost to the athletes, to the coaches, and the people around them and their families mm -hmm. and their health? Mm -hmm. So the, the Ivy League schools, which, by the way, have a couple of good teams that were placed in the top 10 or 15 in wrestling, uh, Princeton and Cornell over the last couple of years have been very good. And they've had some All-Americans and, and Cornell had had a bunch of national champions over the year and, and top people that have won even world championships. They, the Ivy League canceled the season. And I know obviously that's a big setback for a lot of wrestlers. At least the NCAA is giving an extra year of eligibility to these wrestlers because of all these, these cancellations. But the Big Ten, which are not, don't have their athletic programs as subordinate to their academic programs, they started late, but they're continuing with this. And I, I just think that's, I just think that's such a danger to people. And that's not a decision that a bunch of people in their teens and early 20s, a bunch of young people can make because, you know, you think you're fearless, you think you're invincible, and you're just going to go out and do anything. So wrestling is an absolute chaos. Well, and, they should, everyone should have canceled their wrestling season, not just the Ivy League schools, if you want. My personal opinion, everybody should have canceled their season. Until right. everyone and you is vaccinated, until you put in mandatory COVID protocols that are the same across all 50 states. Okay, right. that's the thing. It's like everybody wants everybody to do their own thing. Fuck that. Follow these right. rules. This is it. That's it. That's all. And, and, you know, some sports can be more safely played than others. You could argue about that. But you see wrestling, you right, you know, you're right up on top of your opponent. You're laying on one another, okay? Right, and you can't <laughs> wrestle with a mask on. Right. Simple as that. So it, it's the particularity of the sport. And I, I, I mean, it, it, in a way, it's heartbreaking to me to say this because I know an athlete's career is very short and very limited, and young people aren't thinking a lot of times years ahead and also if you postpone a season or two you're going to have another class of wrestlers coming in uh, some of whom are going to be really good who are really uh, studs in high school so it can create problems for the sport but I think those are secondary to the health issues and I think behind it is that running wrestling are a lot of maggots a lot of people who are just really have really reactionary views who are anti-public health to begin with. And I think that's something that's a, it's still a real problem in wrestling. Yeah. You've seen the, the number of black wrestlers in wrestling is very small. And you got to remember, too, that the top schools in wrestling are state schools. Well, I'm not talking about the Ivy League schools. I think, in fact, every year since they've run the NCAA wrestling championships and became Division One, except one year, every year the national championship has been won by a state school. You know, in recent years, Iowa, Penn State, Ohio State, and, and so forth. For the Minnesota, Iowa State, Oklahoma State. And yet you've seen the, the number of black wrestlers and black coaches diminish. It's relatively small compared to the population of the, of the places that they're in. And so you have groups like the Black Wrestling Association are trying to change that, but it's, it's still a real uphill battle. And you have USA Wrestling giving lip service to it, but they could set up a diversity committee and all of this, but the whole or culture. Or they could just go out and recruit more wrestlers or develop a wrestling program in some of these schools. I mean, uh, you don't need to create a diversity program. They just need to be actively recruiting BIPOC uh, wrestlers. 
there's a move right there's there's a move now i don't think any of the the uh hcbus are historically h how do i pronounce it hbc the historically black colleges and universities i don't think any of them have have wrestling teams varsity wrestling teams i'm nothing about a club activity oh, yeah. But a varsity team where you hire a coach, you bring in a good coach, you, you pay the coach and the coaching staff a decent salary, you have decent facilities, you give scholarships and all of that. Howard used to have a wrestling team years ago. And wrestling has killed itself. Well, because I don't think there's, I mean, what money is there if you become a wrestler or you, I mean, I... I get it. They don't, they don't market the sport properly. I've been over this for 30 guys years. Guys would rather play basketball or football. Yeah, but not everybody can play or is as good playing uh, football or basketball. Right. And, and yeah, and various attempts at creating a professional, a real professional wrestling league over the years have failed because they're not organized by professionals. And as a friend of mine, and I keep saying I'm going to get permission from him to uh, to name him in the quote, mm -hmm. but he's a, a, a very well known in wrestling, a member of the Hall of Fame, an Olympian, and all of that. Once told me the problem with wrestling is that it's run by wrestlers. <laughs> if you look at every other professional league, okay, who's running the NBA? Is it Michael Jordan? No, they have a whole group of people doing it. Who's running Major League Baseball? Is it Willie Mays? No. Okay. You may have Jeter as the uh, one of the owners of the Miami Marlins, but you have other professionals running these sports. Okay. Who's running the NFL? Is it Joe Montana? No. Okay. They have professionals running, and it's certainly far from uh, you know being above criticism in the way that they're running it. But they have they have professionals and maybe these people had some at some point when they were younger competed in the sport at some lower level and certainly didn't make it to the elite level but you have you have to have people that know how to do sports management and i've said this a million and one times and there's resistance i said in the us alone there were over 300 programs in colleges and universities, including some of the top colleges that have sports management programs. And I think some are graduate and some are undergraduate. And I spoke at one of them a couple of years ago at Columbia. And why are these, why are the people who are involved in these sports, these smaller sports, not going to these programs? You know why? Because the ones who do go to the programs, they try and go into wrestling and say, you know, you should be doing this or that. And they're not listened to. And they can say, the hell with it. I'm going to work for professionals. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to work for obstinate, incompetent clowns. So they'll go, if they're pursuing a career, they'll go somewhere else. And therefore, we're left with what we're left with now that the, the great sport of wrestling, the world's oldest sport, does not have a sustainable, real professional wrestling league. There were attempts in some styles of wrestling, such as uh, the African Warriors Fighting Championship was creating a professional organization that included two traditional African styles. One was Dombe, which is a form of boxing. And the other was African wrestling, which is sort of blend of some of the different styles that are used mainly in Nigeria and w was real wrestling. But the, they were just getting off the ground and then the pandemic hit. So, so they've gotten, they've really unfortunately slowed up. I don't know what direction they're going to go in. I, I saw recently they're going to be putting matches up on YouTube and Facebook, which is not necessarily a good sign because they should be getting TV deals all over the place. And they should it, follow that one championship template. 
Well, you got to have the money and you got, you know, it's very difficult during the, the pandemic to get this stuff going because a lot of the even established sports are just getting, even losing TV rights during the pandemic. The French uh, Football League has had trouble renewing a TV deal. That's like the top football league in, in France. And there have been a lot of others have really run into money problems. So we'll see what happens, you know, when this pandemic is over, hopefully sooner rather than later. But you, again, you need people running this who, who know what the hell they're doing. Absolutely. So and let's get let's get down to the fight last night. I think I fell asleep on I did third too. or fourth round uh, watching that Castano fight with uh, Tex. Oh, you still have the zone? I don't have I don't have the zone. Yeah, I, I resigned up for the zone, so I can Stanio watch. is a good Stanio is a good fighter, who did well in the old uh, World Series of Boxing. I think. I'm just going off the top of my head. I think he had a win over Derevchenko in that, and came a little later to the pro ranks. Yeah, but how was that? You didn't see the whole fight, I guess. I didn't see right. the whole fight, but it was pretty good. I mean, the first—I uh, think I fell asleep around round four. I like Castaño as a fighter. Mm -hmm. I, I fell start. asleep during the ESPN show. I didn't see the Richard. Who was on Comey. that card? Richard Comey sort of had a comeback fight, got a knockdown. The opening fight, that was the only one that I saw the whole fight. You know, I'm getting older. I just talk about being in the after hours club to all hours of the night, you know, and morning. By the time I'd go home, it was usually sun up. I can't do that. So I fell asleep during the ESPN card. But I saw Jared Anderson, uh, up and coming heavyweight, won his fight against uh, Kingsley eBay in the opening fight, heavyweights. And Anderson has a big punch. Uh, he seems a little, a little stiff and a little too interested in showboating mm. at this point. Uh, I wasn't real impressed with his footwork. The announcers, of course, were praising him, you know, to the sun. He's moving like a middleweight. I didn't <laughs> see him moving like a middleweight. Uh, he certainly dominated the whole fight and finally got it was just a six rounder and finally got a devastating knockout in in round six uh but i didn't you know I, he's young he has a lot of he has a lot of things to learn so they're really touting this guy but boxing is also facing its huge crisis with the whole daniel kinahan scandal coming to the fore again and soiling the proposed Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua fight. I, I hope it does, because I really don't want to see Anthony Joshua tied up, mixed up with that whole Kenahan shit bag of a story. Well, the question is, everybody wants to see an undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. And most people have Fury number one and Joshua number two. Fury has the WBC belt. He's undefeated. He took care of Wilder, who I think is, you know, done, pretty much done. Yep. And and a lot of people, like a lot of the people that follow boxing, like Ring Magazine, have him as their champion. Joshua got his revenge against Andy Ruiz, but he still was stopped by Ruiz. He came back, and he, I thought he looked good against Pulev. He has that one loss and he holds the other major belts, the IBF, the WBA, and the WBO belts. So these are the top two. Pretty much everyone agrees. Everybody wants to see that fight, but Kinahan is involved with Fury, not with Joshua. So the question you raise is important because Fury's legacy, whatever happens in these it's supposed to be two fights, Again, let's see them have one first. You know, it's boxing. You know, nothing is guaranteed. Let's see what happens. But Fury's legacy, when it's written, is still going to be tied up with Kinahan, the Irish reputed mom boss. It's still going to be tied up with a lot of the 
racist and homophobic and transphobic comments and anti-Semitic comments that he made earlier in his career, which he's kind of like quashed and become more sophisticated in his PR work. And Joshua's legacy is going to be different because Joshua has play, he's played it safer, but he's also spoken out on some issues. He was at some Black Lives Matter rallies over this past summer in the UK, which some racists were criticizing him for because he said it was important to support black businesses. He, of course, his family, his heritage is from Nigeria, and he's expressed a lot of uh, support for people in Nigeria. And who knows if he'll ever fight there. And again, the pandemic has thrown everything to hell. But he met with uh, Fela Kuti's son, who's very active there, when he was there like a year or two ago. And he views himself as a citizen of the world. And he has he, he's somebody that could have the legacy of being a tremendous inspiration to people. Maybe not on the level of Muhammad Ali, because we're not in the, the social and political period of the 1960s like Muhammad Ali. Right. But he could have that international positive influence. And so I don't think, you know, he's not directly tied up. His promoter, Eddie Hearn, will have to negotiate with Aram, who's dealing, you know, who's, who's one of the co-promoters of Fury and who's, who's dealing obviously with Kinahan, I don't know that it'll necessarily soil uh, Anthony Joshua's legacy. Well, I but think he has to win. He has every, to win. I don't know. I mean, when I say soil his legacy, I just mean, I mean, I don't mean, I don't think it's going to soil his legacy. Let me just say that. I think if I were his manager, I would not want him associated with Kenahan. I would not take a fight until Kenahan was out of the deal. And so I would be comfortable taking money, accepting money from somebody who was not drug running or sex trafficking or human trafficking. Cause I don't want my paycheck coming from that. So that's all I'm saying. Is well, he gonna, the, the, he, you they know probably the will fight in Saudi Arabia because that's where the dirty money can be laundered and nobody, everybody thinks it's okay. Right, that that's where the the most money is going to come from. Because again, if those two fought in somewhere in the UK, uh, without the pandemic, they could sell out an eighty or ninety thousand seat football stadium in a, in a minute, and get enormous amount of revenue from the pay per view and all of that. But you can't do that right now in the UK. And they want to have this fight by Eddie Hearns we're talking about having the fight sometime in June, sometime around then. And you can't safely do it. So you could do it in the UK with, in a smaller arena, you know, maybe the O2 when you bring in a, a couple of thousand fans, you're not going to get the revenue from that. So how do you make up the revenue? As you said, they do it in some country like Saudi Arabia or Dubai, in the UAE, where they were going, they're going to overpay to make up that 50 to $100 million difference. They're going to pay a rights fee, no matter what little arena they had. When, when uh, Joshua Fort Ruiz there before, they built a makeshift, makeshift arena for that, and then they tore it down right afterwards. He, or they could fight indoors, because if they're going to do it in June, in one of these countries in the Middle East, it's going to be probably too hot to do it outdoors. So you could do it in one of their indoor arenas, but they'll make up the difference to show how, quote, wonderful and modern and democratic these, these countries have become, you know, all the kind of propaganda coming out of it. So already he's, he, he took some of that blood money from Saudi Arabia. But I, how much does that affect his legacy, because when Ali fought Foreman, that was into the under the dictator Mobutu in Zaire. When he fought the third fight, the thriller in Manila with Frazier, that was under the dictator Marcos in the Philippines. 
Well, uh, that's what I was saying. It's not going to soil his legacy at all. It's just that I hope, you know, being a, the, uh, you know, he's now an activist. He's now being this, you know, he's taking that sports justice route. So, I, you know, to me, I would make a stand if I would say, you know, if, if it were offered to me that Kenahan is still in the picture, then I would say, hell no, I'm not signing that contract. But how are you, the, how are you really going to know? Because the way this works with Kenahan, he has... The, the rules of boxing is so purposely porous. He's a, quote, advisor. That is not a legal position. And, and again, if, if you're talking about doing a fight in Saudi Arabia or the UAE, what are the, the rules of boxing? You don't even have rules that you have in, in, say, the British Boxing Board of Control or any of the other. The athletic commissions in North America, you don't have anything like that. You may have a nominal boxing commission that's part of the monarchy. See, it, with all the problems in the U.S. and and the U.K., those commissions are at least technically, they're part of the government, but they're independent agencies that are part of the government. They're not part of the promoters. See, so you go to Saudi Arabia with a monarchy. Who are the promoters there? Well, it's a public investment fund and various sheiks, people like that, who are part of, part of the monarchy or directly hired by the monarchy. And they usually hire some Americans. I remember when Joshua Fort Ruiz, I forget the guy's name, but they had an American there on the stage. A guy was from Brooklyn. Yeah, another Brooklyn reference who's basically promoting this thing and talking about how wonderful everything was in, in Saudi Arabia. And, you know, he's wearing like an American business suit and you could tell he was originally from Brooklyn and all that from the way he spoke. They do all this, but it's basically the monarchy making these decisions. Mm -hmm. You don't have any kind of independent boxing commission that's separate from the monarchy because even if they establish one they're going to put somebody who's part of the monarchy or directly responsible to it as part of the commission who else is going to which is also the promoter see so you just have a sort of naked conflict of interest mm -hmm. in a uh, in a monarchy but that's the, dirt, the dirty boxing business gets dirtier over in the UAE in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, and so so this is where they're doing to maximize the revenue given the pandemic. I, I have no question that if there were not a pandemic and you're going to have this fight, that it would be in, they had already picked out. Yeah, it was going to happen in the UK. Stadiums. It yeah. was going to be in the UK and the rematch there's a rematch clause, and if they did that, that either could have been in the UK or the United States, yeah. and wherever. Uh, but now they're gonna now they're gonna have to do that, and they've both been there before. Did Joshua's fight with Ruiz in uh, December? It was I think it was December 2019, and was that November or December? Whenever that was, I think it was December. December. And. Fury was there before. This wasn't real fighting, but he was there for a WWE show in Saudi Arabia. So they've both been there before. Well, the fight's going to happen, and it's going to probably happen in the UAE. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, it's we'll boxing. Unless, unless UK gets it together and gets everybody vaccinated, and they establish some COVID protocols for public events. They have COVID protocols, but you have the UK so variant, which is getting worse and worse. It's much more contagious, and right, right. some reports say it's even deadlier than uh, the the original COVID nineteen. Right. So it's going to be a while before you get things opened up, so you could have such a large crowd yeah. like you did in the past. And that's you know because of the Boris Johnson government. Remember at the beginning they said we're not going to do anything. We're going to have herd immunity. You know, and let tons of people die. Just a horribly anti-people view, anti-public health view, which is typical of the Tories. 
and the the labor the people running labor a bunch of clowns completely screwed up that's in a different issue the whole yeah, at least a conversation up. they they gave in to the whole uh nationalist and racist view on brexit and weren't the champions of the of the remain people and so now the majority of people in the uk now they want they want to go back to the european union but it's not so simple just to do that just a couple of months after you split from it so for boxing it's going to take a while to get back it's oh, just yeah. a horrible situation and the promoters do not want a really strong central body which would control boxing and the sanctioning bodies to pretty much do whatever the hell the promoters want whatever they want to get more sanctioning fees mm -hmm. which is why you, you start to explain to people that don't follow boxing well what do you mean a heavyweight title unification fight that fury holds one belt and joshua holds three belts but fury is number one and you start to explain this stuff to people their heads is what kind of insane situation is this in the sport of boxing well, Eddie, it has been good chopping it up with you today. My yes. friend in the war room, Sports Justice fans, if you want in-depth analysis from the Sage of Combat Sports, then definitely follow my friend, Eddie Goldman, sports writer and political commentator of the No Holds Barred radio show. Now on Patreon, please subscribe to Eddie on Patreon. Follow him at NHB News on Twitter and Patreon. Thank you, Eddie. You have a good Thank day. Thank you brother. so much. Again, happy Valentine's Day to you and yours. And we shall be talking again soon. All right, my brother. Peace out. Be well. Take care. Peace.